Ein besonders herzliches Willkommen geht an David Klarbaut, der heute Abend den Künstlervortrag halten wird. Die Einladung dazu verdanken wir dem Espace Louis Vuitton und PIN, den Freunden der Pinakothek der Moderne. Und ich möchte das Wort daher gleich weitergeben an Dorothee Wahl, die Vorsitzende des Fördervereins. Ja, guten Abend. Als Vorsitzende von PIN, dem Freunden der Pinakothek der Moderne, begrüße ich Sie auch ganz herzlich zu diesem Talk mit David Klarbaut. Wir freuen uns besonders, dass das heute Abend in der Pinakothek der Moderne zustande kommt. Denn PIN hat eine längere Geschichte mit dem Künstler. Wir haben für die Sammlung, die Sammlung Moderne Kunst im Haus, drei Arbeiten angekauft. Und zwar, äh, wie Sie hier sehen, Kindergarten Antonio Sant'Elia 1932. Das ist entstanden 1998 und wir haben das 2009 angekauft. Und eine weitere Videoarbeit äh, befindet sich ebenfalls im Bestand, das ist Long Goodbye. Außerdem haben wir zu Long Goodbye eine Vorzeichnung für das Museum erworben, das sich ebenfalls in unseren Beständen befindet. Ja, Zeit ist das zentrale Thema im Oeuvre des Belgiers David Klabaut, ähm, der zu den internationalen bekanntesten Videokündlern seiner Zeit, seiner Generation zählt. Und Zeit, finden wir, ist auch zu einem zentralen Thema in unserer Welt geworden. Für ihn in seinem Bild, bildmächtigen Werk ähm, arbeitet der Bau sowohl mit gefundenen als auch mit historischen Fotografien, wie Sie ja hier genau sehen werden. Und wir finden es wunderbar, dass äh, in der Gestaltung er zugleich die, Warnung, die Wahrnehmung, die Inszenierung und die Verbindlichkeit von Bildern in der heute zunehmend digitalisierten Welt hinterfragt. Ähm, wir freuen uns, dass das zustande gekommen ist. Ich bedanke mich ganz herzlich bei unserem Kooperationspartner, dem Espace Louis Vuitton. Mit dem Unternehmen verbindet uns ebenfalls eine lange Geschichte. Und wir sind sehr froh, wenn es uns gelingt, solche Abende wie heute über die Kulturinstitutionen dieser Stadt hinweg zu organisieren und für ein interessiertes Publikum anzubieten. Ich möchte Frau Sarah Haugeneder vom Espace Louis Vuitton bitten, auch noch ein paar Worte zu Ihnen zu reden, bevor dann endlich der Künstler dran ist. Danke. Lieber Bernhard, liebe Frau Wahl, lieber David, vielen Dank, dass dieser Abend heute zustande kommt. Wir freuen uns wirklich außerordentlich, dass du, David, heute noch mal nach München gekommen bist und vor der Eröffnung bei Rüdiger Schöttle noch einen Vortrag zu deinen Arbeiten hältst. Und ähm, David wird eben im Speziellen auch über die beiden Arbeiten, die wir im Moment im Espace Louis Vuitton zeigen, sprechen, nämlich Algier, Sections of a Happy Moment und ähm, Travel. Wir laden Sie auch alle ganz herzlich ein, äh, den Espace zu besuchen, falls Sie die Ausstellungen noch nicht gesehen haben und freuen uns auf den Abend. Ähm, vielen Dank, dass du da bist, David, und einen schönen Vortrag. Bei drei Begrüßungen muss man nicht mehr sagen, dass äh, David Klabaut einer der prominentesten Medienkünstler seiner Generation ist. Ich möchte oder ich bin darauf hingewiesen worden, gleich am Anfang noch mal zu sagen, dass da vorne eine Kamera im äh, Publikum steht, die aber den ganzen Abend oder nicht den gesamten Abend, aber zumindest den Vortrag von David Klabaut aufnimmt für interne Zwecke. Es wird also auch, das sage ich deswegen, äh, am, an, am Schluss ein Gelegenheit geben, für Sie zu fragen und von David zu antworten oder, soweit ich das kann, auch von mir. Von meiner Seite, diese Fragen werden nicht aufgezeichnet. Sie können also alles fragen, was Ihnen unklar geblieben ist. Ja, als ich mir nochmal so vergegenwärtigt habe, was David Labaut alles so gemacht hat, war ich beeindruckt von der Fülle der Ausstellungen, die er hatte und auch jetzt ja, haben wird. Allein in den letzten drei Jahren waren das Museen von Antwerpen, Basel und Barcelona über Clermont-Ferrand, Dublin und Genf bis Sao Paulo, Stuttgart und Wellington in Neuseeland. Im Juli eröffnet eine Einzelausstellung im Kunsthaus Bregenz, was ja von uns aus sehr leicht zu erreichen ist. Im September eine im Museum für zeitgenössische Kunst Lesabattoire in Toulouse. Auch in München war und ist David Klabaut immer wieder präsent, wie die derzeitige Ausstellung im Espace Louis Vuitton belegt, aber auch äh, die Ausstellung, die heute Abend äh, bei Rüdiger Schöttle eröffnet wird. Bereits 2011, Dorothee Wahl sagte es, präsentierte David Klabaut, meine Kollegin, also meine Kollegin präsentierte David Klabaut, Inka Grewe-Ingelmann war es, die verantwortlich ist hier für den Bereich Fotografie und neue Medien, 
David, you surely remember this exhibition seven years ago and your talk exactly or actually here in this auditorium, so this is well known. Ausgangspunkt für unsere Ausstellung, auch das wurde kurz gesagt, bilden zwei kapitale Erwerbungen. Dank des Engagements konnten diese beiden Erwerbungen in unsere Sammlung kommen. Es sind zwei für das Schaffen Klabauts ganz wichtige Werke. Eines davon wurde eben schon äh, gezeigt, wobei Sie jetzt vielleicht glauben, wenn Sie es nicht kennen, dass es eine Fotografie ist. Ist es aber nicht. Eine Fotografie spielt aber trotzdem eine Rolle. Es ist ein statischer Blick auf spielende Kinder unter Bäumen. Offenbar 1932, denn die Jahreszahl 1932 gehört zum Titel. Wenn man genauer und länger drauf schaut, aufs Original, nicht auf das Bild, sieht man, dass die Blätter der Bäume sich bewegen. Die Bäume sind somit lebendig. Doch was ist aus den Kindern geworden, die 1932 vier oder fünf Jahre alt gewesen sind? Mit diesem Spannungsverhältnis spielt David Labaut und äh, ich werde darauf gleich noch mal kurz zumindest eingehen, damit Sie vorbereitet sind auf die detaillierten äh, Erläuterungen von David Klabaut selbst. Kurz nach den Ankäufen durch PIN hat dann auch die Sammlung Brandhorst eine kapitale Zweikanalinstallation erworben und zusammen mit den Dokumenten, den Zeichnungen, befindet sich damit eine doch recht, recht substanzielle Werkgruppe des Künstlers in unseren Häusern. Das ist sehr schön. Im Bereich der zeitgenössischen Medienkunst sind die Arbeiten von David Klabaut, der seit mehr als 20 Jahren jetzt arbeitet und diese entwickelt, auffallend. Sie unterscheiden sich von vielen anderen Medienarbeiten. Das liegt auch an den digitalen Bildtechniken, die er einsetzt. Mithilfe dieser Techniken und ich betone den technischen Aspekt hier eben ganz besonders, weil Sie alle wissen, wie technische Entwicklungen, wie rasant die sich voran entwickeln und äh, man immer wieder auch auf neue Gerätschaften und neue Tools zurückgreifen kann. Mithilfe dieser Techniken, wo für die äh, David Klabaut im Bereich der Bildenden Kunst immer ein Vorreiter gewesen ist, mit diesen Techniken schafft er eindrucksvolle Bildparabeln über die großen menschlichen Themen, also die Themen, die alle Künstler zu allen Zeiten auch interessiert haben, unsere emotionalen Erfahrungen, unsere Vorstellungen und Erwartungen über den Sinn des Lebens, über die Vergänglichkeit des Seins. Er macht es nur eben mit, mit einer neuen Technik und da kann ich auch da wieder darauf hinweisen, dass diese partielle Bewegung der Blätter in einer Fotografie oder einem Film, der genau das zeigt, der statisches Bild und Bewegung verbindet, damals als es entstanden ist, in den 90er Jahren noch was wirklich ganz Neues war. Man sieht es in Arbeiten auch an, dass es 20 Jahre alte Arbeiten sind. Wenn das heute entstünde, dann wäre das natürlich viel perfekter auch möglich. Aber das macht natürlich den Reiz auch solcher älteren Arbeiten aus. Formal wie inhaltlich komplex erweitern die Arbeiten eben damit auch unsere Bildwahrnehmung und zwar in jeder Generation auch wieder neu. Die Arbeiten von Klabaut, vor allem die frühen, sind hybride Wesen im Grenzbereich zwischen Fotografie und Videokunst. Denn durch die Teilanimation, also den partiellen Einbau von bewegten Elementen, sind es keine Fotografien mehr, aber eben aufgrund des statischen Charakters noch keine Filme. In dieser Zwischenzone von nicht mehr und noch nicht bewegt sich das gesamte künstlerische Werk David Klabauts, auch wenn er heute anders arbeitet. Klabauts zentrales Thema, Dorothee Wahr sagt es auch schon, ist die Zeit. In seinen Werken verstreicht Zeit sichtbar und spürbar, doch die dargestellte Zeit entspricht nicht unserer Erfahrung und unserer Zeitvorstellung. Das heißt, wenn wir die Werke ansehen, erfahren wir eine andere Zeit, als die wir im Alltag erleben. David Klabaut schafft damit neue und andersartige Zeiterfahrungen, in denen die Grenze zwischen Vergangenem, Gegenwärtigen und Zukünftigen verwischt. Die Zeit formt seine Werke, macht sie zu einem physischen Erlebnis. Diese Inszenierungen umfassen manchmal wenige Minuten nur, Manchmal auch im Loop, dann bis zu aber auch mehrere Stunden lange Arbeiten gibt es auch, in denen oftmals wenig oder anscheinend wenig Wesentliches passiert. Es gibt keine offensichtliche Geschichte, die erzählt wird, kein Plotpoint, auf den das Ganze zuläuft. Und das steht eben in großem Kontrast zu den oftmals großen Inszenierungen, die man wahrnehmen kann, wenn Sie die, Arbeit, die Arbeiten im Espas Louis Vuitton gesehen haben, dann können Sie sich vorstellen, dass das ziemlich aufwendig ist und äh, von der Perspektive angefangen, von dem Staff, der dahinter stehen muss und äh, eben auch den Bildern, die Kamerabewegungen, das alles ist wahnsinnig aufwendig und erinnert eher an einen großen Kinofilm und dafür passiert eben relativ wenig. 
Je länger die Betrachter auf diesen, vor diesen Projektionen stehen und sich darauf einlassen, umso weniger kann man sicher sein, dass man tatsächlich das ist, was man sieht. Es entsteht ein offener Raum, der anfangs vielleicht auch beunruhigt, vor allen Dingen bei früheren Arbeiten, und manchmal sogar als monoton empfunden wird, weil man dauernd diesen Spannungsmoment empfindet, ohne dass etwas passiert. Bis man dann eben sich eingelassen hat und sich die Zeit nimmt, diesen Raum mit eigenen Assoziationen zu besetzen. Es sind scheinbar belanglose Alltäglichkeiten, die der Künstler darstellt, spielende Kinder in einem Kindergarten, Menschen, die ihn versuchen, in ein Haus reinzukommen, vielleicht kennen Sie die Arbeit mit, dem gläsernen, mit der gläsernen Fassade, wo die Leute von außen, die Kamera ist drin, Leute gucken von außen rein und über Stunden versuchen sie, in dieses Haus zu kommen, kommen aber nicht rein. Oder ein Hausmädchen, das man sieht, wie sie an ihre Arbeit fährt, eine eintönige Arbeit in, einem, in einer Villa und sie geht dann nach, wieder nach Hause, also es wie gesagt, es ist keine Handlung. Aber gerade weil diese Geschichten Geschichte verweigern, gerade weil sie uns nicht mit Botschaften bedrängen, lenken diese Werke die Wahrnehmung auf die eigentlichen Erzähler. Und das ist hier der Wind in den Bäumen, die vergangene Zeit, das Schicksal von Menschen, die Schatten auf einer Fassade, Licht und Geräusche, Raum, Farbe oder auch Nichtfarbe, Musik. In der Vorstellung des Künstlers, und das ist, glaube ich, auch wichtig für diese Generation, und äh, da ist ja auch eine Vorreitergeneration, ist das Bild der Wirklichkeit, das Fotografie und Film übermitteln, immer ein Konstrukt und nie ein Abbild. Ganz wichtig, als ein Konstrukt nämlich kann der Künstler es auch nach seinen eigenen Regeln entwickeln und er ist befreit von der Vorstellung, dass hier Realität wiedergegeben wird, über, ja, nicht Jahrhunderte, aber doch über ein Jahrhundert war das ja das Gegenteil der Fall, dass die Fotografie ein Garant der Wirklichkeit ist und eben lange damit verbunden war, dass das deswegen keine Kunst sein kann, weil der Apparat das Ganze leistet. Der Betrachter wird bei David Labaut ein wesentlicher Akteur, denn das Bild, das er sieht, tritt ein in ein Spannungsverhältnis zu den Bildern seiner Vorstellungskraft, zu Bildern, denen man sonst in der Wirklichkeit nicht begegnet. Beim Betrachten von Klabauts Videoinstallationen stellt sich häufig, und das ist eigentlich immer ziemlich deutlich, ein Gefühl ein. Diese Arbeiten arbeiten über Emotionen, ein Gefühl von Melancholie oft und manchmal auch ein sentimentales Gefühl, wie man es beim Betrachten alter Fotos hat oder beim Betrachten eines elegischen, sentimentalen Films. Denn die Erfahrung vergehender Zeit geht einher natürlich auch mit dem Gefühl, dass da etwas gezeigt wird, was zu Ende geht oder schon zusammen zu Ende gegangen ist, eben für die Vergänglichkeit. Oft wird dabei übersehen, dass äh, sich in manchen Arbeiten auch Humor befindet. Ich habe gerade die Szene ähm, erzählt, wie Menschen sich die Nasen platt drücken an einer gläsernen Fassade. Also Skurriles ist da auch drin und so darf man auch andere Arbeiten anschauen. Man darf es, muss es nicht ganz ernst nehmen, denn diese Künstlichkeit erreicht auch äh, erreicht einen auch und äh, bringt einen vielleicht auch auf andere Gedanken, die nur, nicht nur melancholisch sind. Die Vorstellung, Fotografie und Film könnten den Moment bewahren, erweist sich somit als Illusion, ebenso wie der Glaube, fotografische Bilder wären sofort verständlich. Aus der Enttäuschung heraus, der Enttäuschung heraus, dass nichts passiert, erwächst nämlich dann etwas Neues, eine poetische Kraft, die, wie ich finde, unglaublich anregend ist. Für den heutigen Abend nochmals Dank an den Espace Louis Vuitton und an PIN, vor allem aber an David Klabaut, der sich heute Zeit für uns genommen hat und seine Werke viel detaillierter beschreiben wird und den ich jetzt aufs Podium bitten darf. Welcome. David Klabaut, heißen Sie uns David Klabaut willkommen. Ich wünsche uns allen eine anregende Begegnung mit seinem Werk. Vielen Dank, Bernhard. Ähm, ich werde auf Englisch reden, ähm, obwohl ich gerne äh, einmal äh, ausprobiert hatte, wie gut mein Deutsch ist, aber es ist immer so äh, eingeschränktes Vokabularium und ich glaube, das wird heute Abend nicht reichen für die Sachen, worüber ich ähm, reden möchte. So, I switch to English, which is always a bit strange, but I assume that all of you um, will be able to follow. Um, normally, if everything goes well, we go now to a slideshow of um, 
exhibition views. We have a little gremlin with the technology, so what you will see is stills, you will only see stills and uh, low-res stills uh, added, but it should be no problem. Um, before I go into the works <coughs> that <coughs> are at the moment running at the Espace Louis Vuitton and a few other pieces, I would like to offer some kind of framework which I think I am supposed and allowed to do because I approach the age of 50 and although I've considered myself um, naive and <coughs> stupid for most of my life, I must admit that by the age of 50 an artist has to be able to speak a few words about his own work. And I think I have unconsciously refused to formulate concepts which preoccupied my work since the very beginning because I was afraid of being trapped in them. And effectively this is something that an artist has to watch out for. Concepts are not what is supposed to be ahead of work, but they are deductions, at least in my case, that can come after many years. One of them, I will talk about three of them. And one of them is the search for materiality and time. In an increasing digital environment, where one could say the haptic and tactile world is being dissolved in some kind of digital acid into a system of um, bits and bytes which basically goes back to Gottfried uh, Leibniz and the calculus. It can be a, a, a challenging to be reminded and to search for what is materiality in an environment which is completely virtual, or which promises to become completely virtual. We know very well that ourselves as a human agent will always be in the way of complete virtualization, but this is at least the ideology in which we are incorporated, is that we are inside a world which around us is becoming uh, where things become referent and lose their thingness. And this is not unimportant. My search for work in time and duration, I think, comes out of this worry that uh, duration might itself be uh, as much um, chopped up in atoms or in seconds um, as to apply to duration something that we also apply to history, which is we apply a formal um, geometric, um, we impose a geometric uh, view onto duration. And at least since Henri Bergson, we know that duration, it's very hard to talk about it in the first place. Um, and that linear duration, which is our main concept based upon which we live and we organize life and history, is nothing else than uh, uh, falsification of the real thing, because the real thing is completely unmeasurable. And so, theoretically, it should be possible to travel back in time and forward or to stay stuck in the now. Digital, somehow, has opened up um, our awareness for that linear time, analog time we might say, but that's a lie, um, or let's say it's a fake concept, analog time, that digital is opening up the borders that used to be um, severely uh, um, outlined between the past, the present and the future. And effectively cinema was the first order to be dissolved into digital, whereas we might by now conclude that gaming is in fact a new cinema and gaming does propose a moving back uh, in time but also in scenarios or moving forward and to have a bio biological link with duration. 
So, that first concept, which is the search for materiality and time, of course, is broader than just um, the problem of duration. Um, it goes deeper, and it goes, I would compare it to a transition. Imagine the doctor says tomorrow that you have a problem with your vision and you will go blind. You have three months. And the question is, what will you do first? Back in the 90s, I remember uh, this rather kitschy movie, The Five Senses, about somebody who's effectively being announced that he will go blind and goes out in the world and tries to touch as much as possible, tries to speak, but basically speaks to his own memory. And while he's alive still, and whilst he still has a vision, um, he's already, from that moment on, when he's declared that he will have no more vision, he's, he's in the past. And he's trying to reformulate what materiality meant in his past. And I claim that vision in the future, when it has radically dissolved into the asset of the digital, is a vis vision without optics. And without photography, naturally, without cinema, based on a lens, um, but also probably, and I have no scientific claim about this, but I think ideologically I can expect it, probably even without the use of our own eyes. Which leads me to deduce that, and I really sorry, I'm really sorry if I'm making big leaps uh, theoretically now, which makes me to deduce from there that it is theoretically again possible that we see without our eyes. And I've been led to certain assumptions by working um, as Bernard first uh, suggested with the more complex works such as travel. When my own world started to dissolve into a world of uh, coding and um, uh, geometrical um, uh, lines uh, colored in by textures and then being lit up by an artificial light, etc. When working in 3D, I started realizing that our optical world <coughs> is probably finite. And It's a bit tough to outline where it goes to, or maybe where it regresses to, but I think it regresses to, or it goes to, um, um, re-empowerment of ideology and of the word. In favor or in disfavor of um, photography, among others, which was, one could say, a short-lived anarchy of vision, which allowed for about 180 years, um, at least conceptually, it allowed an apparatus to stand in our way of our own perception and the world out there. And that apparatus had an incredible function, in the sense that this lens was actually as always a sign of light and of hope by its nature, by the way it was worked. It let in light, um, but also because it needed light to record something, it was structurally a uh, technology of hope. The new technology, which is that of scanning, is a, uh, an ideology of avoidance. It does not look, but it feels around it, and it tries to feel whether it will hurt, itself or someone else. It's a completely different approach. Um, and it also doesn't allow anymore for the concept of photography as this thing that, without worries, is able to record what is out there and is a witness which is beyond, um, beyond doubt, has this authority, autonomous authority of the event. Now, so that's my... I have to watch out that my hour is not over. And I haven't 
gotten to my second concept. Um, so materiality and time is a first and primordial worry. A more recent <coughs> realization that I made or that I understood was that I am against um, the Anthropos in the center or the Anthropos as the center in the universe and that I am probably an anti-anthropocentric um, worker. You can trace that quite back uh, far in the past. So, anti-anthropocentric. I always hope nobody is going to ask me to repeat it because it's such a tough word. Anti-anthropocentric. There's this, this a long-standing tradition of that. Um, in my work, this goes back actually to kindergarten where the trees structurally survive the people in the image. And uh, while looking at it, the viewer obviously realizes that the present that you are looking at is at the same time also death but it's a postponed form of, the, form of death. So I prioritized trees. And I've always prioritized concepts that <clears throat> we tend to discard as secondary or as even almost trash, such as uh, nature or the background. But uh, honestly, I prefer to avoid the term nature because what is it? Um, but we could say nature as a background. For us, and let's all admit this, nature serves as a garden. It is something that always stands behind the, the scene. It always stands behind the story that is being told in the now. And that continues in works like Bordeaux Peace, where actors have to repeat 75 times the same film until they collapse with fatigue. And the only thing that has been standing strong all this time was the movement of, of the shadows and of the passage of the day. It continues to a more recent work like Olympia, where um, nature is allowed to grow over the course of a thousand years, and Olympia is based upon the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. But it also comes back to the second um, slideshow that I would like to start, which is the Algiers sections of a happy moment. I hope you can hear me really that you could switch to the other slideshow. Thank you. And Algiers sections of a happy moment, which is one of the, I think must be somewhere in the middle of the 45 works that I've made up until now. Um, 2008 or 2007? Eight. Eight, right. Eight. Which, as um, so, some of you might know, appears to be a slideshow of uh, about 180 uh, stills, which are taken by or captured by a same and singular eye of one moment in time. And it's important that this moment be insignificant, that there's no, that it doesn't have a lot of uh, political or narrative powers behind it in itself. So that I could not be credited with having found a very good subject matter. I really, this is very important that the subject matter is, um, looks like a side uh, movement. And in this case, it's a man who serves a piece of bread to a bunch of seagulls that hang above the scene. Um, you're now seeing some notes that I made during the production. The work has actually been made very laboriously, as uh, Bernard also suggested in the beginning, using more than 50,000 uh, stills. Over a period of several years, I forgot how long, and I'm glad to have forgotten how long, how much work I put into something. But essential is that you don't see the work, that you don't see the spectacular amount of labor in it. And labor is, again, one of these um, background concepts is something that we do not really like. Labor is too expensive. Um, we outsource it. There's no more labor in Europe or hardly any. 
So it's outsourced. It's, it's one of these things which are, one of these concepts which are under threat. And it's almost as if we're talking about um, endangered species, such as time, um, such as nature, and also, of course, um, uh, labor. And so we worked for, uh, with those 50,000 images, uh, we worked on a collage. I made, I always make studies, drawings, which are left over of my um, rather intensive uh, academy uh, time. I think I was one of the few students who took the job serious of being a student. And in Belgium, training is still, or was, very uh, conservative which had, of course, a disadvantage, but also advantages, is that it's a little bit like studying Latin. You wonder why you do it, but when you, when you get 50, you know why you did it. And so it allowed me to keep on thinking about the works, even if the, the, the process in the studio is made by several assistants, sometimes more than 10, between 10 and 20 people, and is, it can be hard to keep track of what we're doing. So essential in a work environment like that is that you have simple concepts to work from. Um, ones that will not bite back, ones that you know when you're at the end of the process of working, you will meet them again as friends. Um, and so... Um, About the anti-anthropocentrism, which I managed to pronounce rightfully once more, in Algiers sections of a happy moment, there is of course, um, and also materiality, or main, actually primor primordially, primordially about materiality, there is a transition occurring in this work. It's a very simple transition. It's a transition from photography, from looking at photography to a transition or to a reality which is more sculptural than photographic. And this happens in an um, unobtrusive manner, I hope, by the passage of time, by sitting in front of the work and allowing a few minutes to pass, or ideally a little longer, so that brings me to another point of resistance is, of course, what do you do with a spectator who has no time? In a situation like that, you're actually king because the artist has a lot of it. And conceptually alone, that sort of time, that sort of use of time would belong to the church visitor, not to the museum visitor, who nowadays is increasingly informed with all kinds of information, which Jean Baudrillard nicely termed 3D information. Basically, um, all the garbage which you don't need to see an image. And if you deduce all that 3D information and you go back to what Baudrillard called 2D information, you get an image which lives in time. And um, for which duration and spending time in front of it is essential. If you don't do it, fine, but then you go home with a single image or something that has not transitioned into something else. And in the Algiers section of a happy moment, the transition is from photography into sculpture, very simple. It is the certitude that photography was, which is gone. And it has made place for a doubt that these figures, which, because they were photography, you also think they are flesh and blood at one point in time, which they appear not to be. They appear to be completely artificial proposals put together. And they gain, instead of being humans of flesh and blood, they gain a certain, as if they were made out of concrete and then painted upon as if they were fabricated with a different kind of material than photography. And that's all this liquid back and forth between 
the history of materials that we are talking about in the photography, the way I try to practice it. Of course, if I speak about the death of photography in 100 years, you will tell me that I was wrong because photography still exists. But yes, it still existed as an afterlife, as a ritualistic afterlife. This is what happened to painting. Photography is undergoing now what painting underwent about 200 years ago. And the early modernists, of course, sensed what was happening. The optical revolution happened, of course, much longer, and it was sensed among early modern artists. But that I don't have to um, explain. It would take us too far. But now we are saying goodbye to photography as, uh, as an ideology. And um, back to the Algiers sections of a happy moment, there is possibly, of course, also not a proposition in the work for those who have seen it. Um, there's the seagulls who themselves also transition from photography into something else. And in fact, when you look at an image or at a bundle of images, one should always ask, where is the punctum? I do that always. I, for example, the work here, the Pipilotirist installation, I ask myself, where is the punctum? The punctum is in the, in the bottles of alcohol which are standing there. And of which if you start to think about them and analyze them, the whole work starts to revolve around that. And so punctum is, of course, a form of editing. But in the Algiers sections of a happy moment, you get the seagulls whose gaze as being animal change into a gaze which becomes human and which becomes almost paranoia, I would say, because you keep on looking at them and they keep on looking at the people. And slowly on, these innocent animal eyes turn into, which seagulls can have, quite aggressive gazes. And there you have it. You have a scene from above, a powerful gaze above, and a very friendly gaze from below. And I made that work, of course, long after 9-11. But it was with, somehow with, um, with a class of people in mind um, upon which I sensed they, they would have a hard time looking back at the rest of the world. And that's, I think, where the Algiers sections of a happy moment comes from. The punctum, however, lies in um, the looking back from the seagulls over time. I think we may now go to the second work, Travel. So, really, if you hear me. Okay. So, <clears throat> Travel, the slides are just a little bit of everything, but there's also some of the production images of, of the work. And um, I always think when I start a work, uh, and basically Bernard was right there, that through the years the works became um, production-wise sometimes very, very complicated and laborious. And I've loved this uh, aspect of labor as something which would not be employed in the service of the spectacular, excuse me, in service of the spectacular, but rather in service of the slowness and um, something that hits back at you really only like a time bomb, only that with a delay. And the, the idea for the work Travel uh, dates back before any of the other works that I show you. It dates back to 1996 and probably even earlier. When um, I, had, I had not even touched a video camera, let alone a photo, ca oh no, a photo camera that I had. I had actually already a collection of reproductions. Um, because that was what I did in the first years of my uh, artist practice. I was only reproducing um, books with a camera. Nowadays one would scan it, but at that time uh, I photographed them. And I had tens of thousands of images like that. And, um, but somehow I also had a passion for uh, kitsch music. 
and no, more notably for uh, relaxation music. Because relaxation music um, reminded me of uh, um, the rhetoric of a populist uh, politician, where on the surface nothing, nothing goes wrong, it all sounds quite uh, reasonable, and the solutions that are being proposed also sound quite realistic. And because of their, um, the images that this relaxation music throws up, whether you like it or not, they throw up images of tranquil forests, of um, a bed, uh, very comfortable, in which you can sleep. And they, of course, this music has as a purpose not to have a quality, but to give you sleep. And I was excited about the idea that music would not have <clears throat> would not have a quality other than sleep, which is almost the opposite. So already there, I, would, I think, I believe I was fascinated with um, what I sometimes call dirty concepts, concept that no, nobody wants, and which I embrace as orphans. And so I had many ideas with that type of music, but I kept only one in my mind. And over a period of 17 years, I made a few drawings, I wrote a little bit about it, um, but each time I would talk to my team, uh, it would be a divided opinion. They would say, no, don't do it. Um, aesthetically, it's risky. They will, people will not understand it. They will think you became uh, uh, melodramatic and uh, mellow, sugary, um, etc. Um, but I, I liked, with the images that the music provoked in my head, I liked that although every music has energy, whether it's uh, productive or non-productive, whether it does something to your system or not, or it enrages you, or you get mad about it, but every music has a certain kind of energy. And <clears throat> this particular piece that I used from a French composer, which is doesn't want to have anything to do with his music anymore, um, Eric Breton. This music had, in the images it provoked, it had both an ascent and a descent. It had something euphoric, but also something utterly depressing. And I loved how the two went hand in hand. Somehow never one would have victory over the other. So it would be not a fight, but a going together of two, of a kind of duality, which I tried to bring in a certain kind of balance, where a third element would hopefully come out of it. Not the ascent, not the depression, but a third energy. Sorry for the pretentious term energy. Maybe I should find something, uh, maybe I should call it a level. And I started working uh, on this with my team in the end, um, after, after 17 years. It took us about three and a half years to produce, and the rendering of the work itself <clears throat> was one year of rendering in a, a, like a stack of computers. Um, we always think of synthetic images as being very discreet, and we always think of the internet as being very discreet as a sea of information, but in fact, the internet is hell. It's burning, extremely hot, at risk of overheating at any time, and needs extreme cooling. So it's basically a device that comes from hell, if to, to say it with a theological term. Um, but somehow, ideologically, it's on the surface. Now, that's the same with rendering of synthetic images. They appear, at the end of the day, to be camera images, but they are done in the um, hot hell of uh, rendering machines. And <clears throat> what you see there are a bunch of polygons. Basically everything in 3D is based on polygons, or sometimes also nowadays on dots. There's a new, uh, new evolution there where we no longer make drawing lines, but where we are uh, drawing dots and make essentially a cloud of points. Uh, but that's all, you know, a little bit um, technological. And <clears throat> travel made me realize that 
this change from uh, light optics into dark optics, and that's the term which I would like to use for the new photography, which is dark optics. Um, dark optics is essentially a, a vision from darkness. It's a, and a vision from darkness can not, not, not be anything else than a vision from concepts. So, anything that you do requires long discussions with your team. How is the grass going to look like? How many brains of grass do we have? Which trees in which part of the world are we? And you automatically reduce the richness of the, of the, of the world into um, a lack, I would call it a lack of biodiversity a lack of diversity in, on all levels. Because as a human being, um, and essentially people who are together discussing how they're going to make a film, it's very hard to be God. So, <clears throat> one limits. And I, I learned a lot from that work in that sense. Um, the storyboard itself was very easy to draw. And these are some of the sketches of it. Because I had been thinking about this work for 17 years, it's a little bit like opening a wine, which has been lying for a while. The chances, well, in older days, that it was good was bigger than if it was had been harvested yesterday. So the, the production process somehow went very easy, um, but very difficult on a, on a pictorial level, I will say. Um, now, with travel, as it is such a dark work, um, it comes also out of a fascination that I had, a long year standing fascination with um, the limitations of the retina. Long ago, I made a series of, um, what I call them black boxes. Uh, they were essentially Jeff Wall-like light boxes, except that they were so dark that if you came into the space, it was impossible to see anything. And you had to physically stay quiet. And there we go again with materiality in darkness. You had to stay quiet to allow for your eyes to adapt to the darkness. And then very slowly, um, this image of night would reappear and the, the black boxes were all, all uh, or we, they had different names, they were all extremely dark nightscapes. So I tried to replicate a, 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 a millennia old human um, situation into something artificial into something that would force, more forcefully uh, create silence and uh, therefore also contemplation. So all of the works have that and in travel similarly people sit in a dark space and they can fall asleep. The work in itself, in itself has very little light. Um, it's mainly also supposed to be um, due to the relaxation music, supposed to take away uh, your active, vita activa and uh, transform it into a vita contemplativa until the end, until then when this uh, song happens and you have this ascend and you have the light. And I always find that strange with uh, sunlight filmed by a camera kind of always hurts the eye. And I wonder why, because technically it doesn't. It's just light as, as any other light beam from a projector. It's very weak light. It's a, it's a very diluted, a very filtered form of light, which is entirely conceptualized. And still, the sunlight hurts your eye. Because it doesn't hurt your eye, it hurts your memory. It hurts the thing that you connect spontaneously to something uh, which is physical. But never let anybody tell you that I'm an experienced artist. I'm not. Um, um, I claim that vision comes through memory and not through uh, experience so much. Um, so we might perhaps 
go to the third work which I would like to talk um, really if you can hear me that would be the pure necessity I, am I, I still have time amazing do you hear me really yes thank you So, there we go again. <clears throat> so again, don't let anybody tell you that my work is about experience. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I have a, a bad faith above me, or about me, is that I tend to, <clears throat> um, without knowing, um, disempower my own work sometimes. And I made this piece right after I had made uh, the Olympia Stadium piece which is a very serious work about the disintegration of a German monument um, of the 1930s into a thousand years of um, weeds and trees and flowers. Also basically a techno-hippie work, but with a serious background. And then this, <coughs> which <coughs> seems to be completely incompatible until you stay, until you give it a while, because it's again, it's, kind of, it's really a dualistic piece in the sense that the aim that I had in my mind where I wanted to go to could not be further away from the origin that I worked with. The Jungle Book, as it existed as an animation in 1967, could not be further away from the purpose that I had in my mind when I made the work. And again, uh, as a simplicity concept, um, the idea was to use something that is kind of in collective memory. It's like every baby has, every adult, every ados, adolescent has somehow has to have seen the Jungle Book. Um, and for a lot of us, it was even a very formative tool um, to learn, to be introduced into childhood, adulthood, autonomy, emancipation, the modern world, what it means to belong to one's own world and not to search for where you're not supposed to go. Um, so a very formative film from 1967 and I imagined that the actors say they were real, say that the uh, animations which are essentially a bunch of lines with colors in them, that they were real color characters that had no more job after 1967. They would have been <clears throat> much older and they would have been roaming around the jungle for another 50 or 60 years and they would have gone back to being an animal without the dialogues, without the energy and without the rhythmical uh, events that are throughout the film. You know, even if you don't understand the word of it, um, uh, this, this still you can't stop moving your body because it's, it, it just invites you for dancing. What's that? Oh, I thought that was me. Sorry. <laughs> Should I take it? <laughs> um, and so I started thinking about um, something which I thought was going to be very simple as usual. Um, but the problem was that in my studio nobody had experience with, um, with animation, of course. I'm the only one who has drawing skills but not really as an animator. And that brought me to the second big challenge of the work, is the definition of animation. Animation, inert lines being brought to life through the same system as cinema, 25 or more frames per second, something that the eye recognizes as smooth and being in motion. 
and giving life to these inert lines. That's the religion of an animator, of somebody who makes cartoons. And I was actually asking the people that I made, a, I actually erected a second studio with 12 animators. Uh, we worked again for another three years. And I asked them something impossible. I asked them to take away life and also this quasi-hormonal energy that is in the dancing and in the uh, storytelling uh, of the Jungle Book, I asked to do the opposite. I asked to make the animals um, be bored, um, sleep, have no interaction among one another or hardly any. Um, and there's one scene in the film, in my film, which comes back literally from the Jungle Book which is the only sort of naturalistic scene, which is a, a tiger hunting a deer, which is Shere Khan being interrupted in his hunting rituals by the elephants. Uh, so I loosely followed the original story line. And I have two versions of the work. I have a, a one hour version, which is a clock, which has uh, at the end the girl uh, singing and I have then I actually have three versions I have a, a hybrid too and the second version is I have a color version which is shorter and which does not have the girl singing and then I have a third version which I show at Rüdiger Schöttle which is um, uh, the sound and the girl singing in 15 minutes 15 minutes um, well that's just how I suppose how artists work um, initially, it was conceived to be a clock because I thought a clock was a good definition of um, the repetition of life. And again, you know, the misconception that time is something spatial, something that's in a, going in a line forward. And then out of that, um, we slowly started to develop uh, a narrative which is not a narrative and an animation which is not an animation. Uh, but as the main, w w for me, with the main purpose to um, take away energy as far as and as much as possible from from this <coughs> icon of of uh, rhythmical and rhythmicality. Now, <coughs> thinking about 1967, there's another issue. It's the high day of cinema, or it becomes goes towards the high day of cinema and it made me think why we have actually lost cinema now. And in a very interesting book by Martin Jay on um, another complicated word, word uh, anti-ocular centrism, which is the struggle between visual culture, one could say, or the eye as the dominant uh, sense and modern French philosophy, for example, um, he pointed me out to this um, issue of cinema after the Second World War and television. And that the reason why, if we look at this auditorium, for example, and we're all sitting in lines, and if this would be a cinema, there would be silence. Um, but the screen would be loud enough to make the silence disappear and to replicate life for us. That there was another function in cinema after the Second World War. It was to gather people in a silent way, in a way to not to have to speak to one another, in a way to outsource dialogue through a third uh, aspect, which would be the screen. And I was wondering, is there an analogy between the Jungle Book and my work um, where this social coherence, one could say, has vanished and people would consume those animations from this individually. And that maybe Mar Margaret Thatcher was right when she claimed that there is no society but there's only individuals and their family. And that the product of those 60 years were precisely that, is that one looks individually. Um, 
And I would also say that there's a certain evolution in this. Even if uh, after the Second World War, collect collectiveness meant sitting in silence next to one another. Um, today, collectiveness means in hyper individuality, and the images that are being that belong to that culture at one point will also be completely internalized and will have nothing to do with projections, they will have everything to do with introjections and that's of course what we could also call madness. But the question is how much collectivity, how much, how much understanding will, will there be in a vision like that? So as far that so there I stop maybe with my um, predictions. Um, well, as you can see in the pure necessity, of course, I wasn't afraid of labor. Um, there's a lot of um, very discreet uh, energy behind it, and again, I think I've said it a number of times. I. I'm interested in looking for the traces of that energy, but not as sugar, not as immediate electricity, not as immediate power, not as something something that would belong still to the to the age of energy uh, coming out of explosiveness, or the, what I sometimes call the logic of the internal combustion engine which is that one, one only has progress if there is also conflict. Progress, even literally going forward. But also maybe progress in, uh, historically speaking, uh, where only conflict would uh, provoke forwardness. And I'm um, really searching for the opposite of that. What, which kind of uh, power or which kind of volume um, significant volume is there possible which is corporeal and unavoidable uh, but discreet and only works over time never works immediately um, and that's that's my that's my complete inquiry and as a last illustration I might want to go to Olympia um, actually, I have a few jokers or jokers, which would be Riverside, and I could work with another, a few other ones. But I think we will start with Olympia uh, because it's not shown in uh, here nor in Germany. It has been shown in Berlin for almost a year, a few years ago. And it basically started, the work started in 2016 and will end in 2016. So it's almost an ironical impossibility or in, in commentary also on um, what software can do. And uh, naturally, if the virtual can have anything which resembles remotely uh, eternity. And I claim sometimes to myself, I rarely say that the virtual is one of the last standing big uh, modern questions. Um, it's a dissolution or dissolution into uh, virtuality of um, the question of eternality in, in modernity, which has never been, which has not been answered, but which keeps on lingering and <coughs> probably incited me to make a piece that would be that would last a thousand years. So I, I, I promised to myself, because I lived in Berlin for a long time, never to make a Berlin work. And um, I made jokes about all these artists living in Berlin at one point, succumbed to the Berlin topic as a sort of semi-artistic but also semi-touristic endeavor. And I had to do it anyway. At one point, when I visited the Olympic Stadium, I think it must have been around 2010, 
um, the idea came and ideas always come, you know, you're never sure if they come as something um, that you want to welcome or if they come as something that you actually wish you'd never had. And in my case, it's often the two. I, I, I knew the first vision was this is going to be hell to produce. Um, but nevertheless, slowly I started to write uh, about the work, I started to think, and first and foremost I started to consult my team. Um, and they said, well, you know, yeah, very hard to, to make, but um, we have no knowledge with, you know, software that runs a thousand years, nobody has. And find me in the gaming industry, somebody who's ever considered anything that had to have to has to last longer than a gaze momentary uh, instant so also there it's in in opposition the work is in resistance but after a few years we decided to start and um, I knew that the main subject of the work would not be the Olympic Stadium never the Third Reich and there's again this comes back where, you know, you will remember the Algier sections of a happy moment where I work in Algeria and where here I work with the topic of the Third Reich but circumscribing the problem through uh, weeds and weeds and nature became my, my ally they became the actors in the work and I intended to let them grow from a chosen point of time which was the uh, I, I think the first or the 15th of March 2016 where the work started where it was born like Frankenstein was born not perfect but uh, perfectioned through the years and um, where there is um, clean grass and everything has been maintained for the last time, which you can actually see in the Olympic Stadium. There are places which are being maintained and others which are not being maintained. And from there I would develop a software which um, would render day by day in real time, together with the real time weather and the real time humidity and rain and snow and frost conditions in Berlin over the decades um, up until a thousand years and I, I, we can with all the consultations that I had from friends and people who are uh, experts in the field of um, uh, materiality and um, biology we could deduce that trees would become the main subject in the work and I only later realized that the root of being German apparently lies in the tree which somebody explained to me recently um, and effectively I realized that there's this thing like which we call the Tingstätte which some of you might know, I don't know a lot about it but effectively which is just an openness surrounded by uh, in forest and so the tree will become the person, so to speak, and there we go again, nature, the background, is taking the foreground. The, the tree and the weeds, um, and I liked the, <laughs> was fascinated with uh, the fact that I was thinking like a hippie, and thinking which weeds would grow at which pace, and uh, how quickly we, we would have trees and how quickly the, the image of the, of the Olympic Stadium would be eclipsed, because that's the goal, of course. After 25 or 30 years, you can see very little of the stadium in my work, um, uh, which is ongoing, day and night. It's, by the way, a very relaxing work. Um, that's another thing about virtuality. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Because it works, it operates from memory. It operates from darkness. But darkness doesn't mean emptiness. And, oh, I have this thing here, I should actually draw something, I asked it and I didn't use it. Um, but I could draw you schemes, but I somehow feel a little bit uh, it at the moment. 
about the relation between, uh, of course, the Camera Obscura and our current concept of the eye and the brain, which is somehow, strangely enough, still a concept of an empty brain. We, when we think about light coming in, we still have just you know, think about it at night. Don't think about it now, or, you know, or, or when you're relaxed with a glass of whiskey or whatever. That our concept of vision is still a concept of a single eye, not two, because there we have a problem with plurality. Uh, our uh, everything we have conceived and, and our visual culture is also about is always about singularity. The moment we try to conceive vision as through two eyes you have a problem, technically, optically, conceptually. And then behind that lies an empty head, a dark room, a camera obscura. I find that always very strange that we still think about our own heads as being empty. <laughs> um, but that's exactly what happens in dark optics, is that you have, um, you have a voluntary head, a head which is filled with information. And, uh, well, again to software and to um, uh, what it is to work in a digital environment. I would even go so far as to say that the further the digital revolution goes, the stronger the call for materiality will be. And there's something that we, that, we, that we name new materiality. There's a lot to do about it. And there's also a philosophical stream which is uh, triple O, uh, object-oriented ontology, which <coughs> goes in the direction also of exploring what the object is and whether it is something, uh, how to redefine the relation of uh, the human being towards the object and if there's something like an outside world. Um, so materiality becomes a stumbling block. It becomes something um, worth remembering because those who will not remember materiality will have a problem. And I've explored that all along my work through light and shadow, but also ice and liquidity, such as in The Quiet Shore, um, the sculptural and the photographic, such as in the algae sections of a happy moment, um, but in, in you know, in, could go through. We could touch all of the works that I've made, and also, of course, Olympia, where the materiality is um, the horizon of time, is the concept of a thousand years. Can you make of a thousand years something like a room? Could you conceive it as a space? Or is it better to keep it as um, something which is inconceivable? Uh, by the way, that's also the problem of uh, the Third Reich, is that um, it was impossible to realize it physically. And when you go back to the theories, or the supposed theories about um, the ruin, the ruin theory, um, it's exactly that. It is a, a, a a spectator standing at the end of a thousand years, looking back at a thousand years. So it's purely conceptual. Um, it has an absolute problem with materiality. Um, so um, that's the, I think, the, um, the question is how, how do you define um, essentially everything around you, uh, not to mention yourself, uh, in a world where all you have is touch and no more vision and and where um, this by the way we see it in apple is this glass or is it metal it's very hard this is, um, things start the, even the objects of today which are supposed to be the objects the utopian objects of tomorrow already have this doubt in their own materiality they're no longer exact in their in their shape and in their um, tactility. And that is what uh, uh, photography is always about. No? Uh, 